Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Willow Creek Presbyterian Church. I'm Lauren and we're so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. If you're wondering where everybody else is, I can tell you that they're at the fair. <laughs> it's been a great week at the Boone County Fair and I want to say thank you so much to all of you who have helped out at the respite tent. Um, if you want to be at the fair with the people who are not here, Jean has three passes to get into the fair today. Um, you can get them from him after worship, um, or you can see me and I'll, we'll organize it, we'll figure it out, we'll work it out. Um, and if you really want to work in the respite tent, and you just haven't had a chance to yet, I can give you the four to six slot today. <laughs> I don't want to take the joy of serving from anybody. Just see me afterwards and we can work that out. Um, but a, truly a huge thank you to everybody. Next week I'll have the numbers of how many folks came through the respite tent, but it's just such a wonderful um, way for us to connect with our community. People are so grateful. So thank you to everybody who's made that possible this week. Um, speaking of serving our community, we have an opportunity to provide breakfast to the faculty and staff at Capron Elementary. Um, there is a sign-up sheet downstairs. We've listed out some breakfast items. You can sign up for what you want to bring. And we're just asking that you bring everything here by noon on Tuesday. That's the day after tomorrow. Um, and then I'll take it down to Cape Breton and then they can have it for their breakfast on Wednesday. If you have any questions about that, let me know. The sign-up sheet is downstairs. There's still a lot of open spots on it. And then after next week, we'll let you know more about this book drive for Capron we've been talking about. So stay tuned for that. We are still accepting resumes for the director teacher of Argyle Preschool. So we are seeking a new director teacher for the upcoming school year. Please spread the word. And if you know of anybody who might be a good fit for that position, just put them in touch with me. Um, we are excited about the preschool, but we are for somebody. Um, I am sad to share that Marsha Rankin, um, Matt Rankin's mother, passed away on Wednesday morning. Um, we pray for the Rankin family, even while rejoicing with them, that she is beyond all suffering. Um, we are still working out details about the service, and we'll keep you posted on those details, but do keep Matt and all who love Marsha in your thoughts and prayers. Oh, bless communion, fellowship divine, we feebly struggle and they in glory shine. For all are one in thee, for all are thine. Alleluia, alleluia. Are there other announcements or prayer requests this morning? Jean. Yes, we do, thank you. We need to be in prayer for the folks impacted by the wildfires in Hawaii especially for those who are grieving lost loved ones. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> That's wonderful. 
It is. We prayed for Brenda's mother-in-law a few months back. She's had some um, health concerns in her heart. Um, can you remind me of her name? Lori. Lori. Um, and so she's recovering remarkably well. She's doing really, really well. Um, Brenda was able to be with her this past week. So that's wonderful news. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, there's... Um, I do need to announce that we don't have nursery this morning. The nursery attendants are also at the fair. All right. If no other prayer requests, let's pause for a word of prayer. God of every time and place, thank you for gathering us here today. Prepare our hearts for worship. May we know if we are grieving that you are with us in our grief. May we know if we are worried that you carry us in our worries. We pray especially for the Rankin family. We pray especially for those in Hawaii. May we know your presence. May they know your presence. May we see you and those around us, and may we hear you. Amen. Please rise, embody your spirit, and join me in our call to worship. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those Come, let us worship the God of wind and waves. Let us worship the Son of God who walks on the water and reaches out to us when we are afraid. Let's remain standing and sing together hymn number 49, The God of Abraham Praise.
We praise you, living God. We praise your holy name. Confession is praise. Confessing our limitations and failures is a way to praise the God who loves us no matter what and who empowers us to live more loving lives. Will you pray with me the prayer? God who gives life to death and calls into being things that were not. We are not as amazed by you as we should be. We take it for granted and forget it is a gift from you. We take all of creation for granted, forgetting it is a gift from and a We don't pause to wonder about your grace because we take that too for granted. <clears throat> We know we mess up and lose our temper and get impatient sometimes, but we know others are and so we generally think we're doing okay. But your word insists on our need for grace. May we believe in our own need, and may we see your grace as the full We need our need for grace also as a gift and not as a sign of failure. Here are silent prayers of confession. Amen. If God is for us, who is against us? It is God who justifies. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at right, the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angel, angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. of Christ with one another saying may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you Will you join your hearts with me in prayer? Holy God, thank you for giving us your word. May we open our hearts to your truth. May your truth make us more like you. Amen. Today's first scripture reading begins on page 1750 of your pew Bibles. It's found in Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Listen for God's word. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith, the faith of Abraham. He is the father of all of us, as it is written, 
I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it is credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Holy Wisdom. All of God's children said. Yeah. Thank you, Mandy. And Tom. I would like to invite the children to come up for a children's yeah. moment. Good morning. Have you been to the fair this week? Uh, twice this week. Twice this week? My goodness. I only went there once. Only once. 
Once is a lot, though. That's still a lot of fun. Did you all happen to go by our church's respite tent while you were there? Uh, what the, what does that mean? Thank you. That was what I was going to ask you. So we have a tent at the fair called a respite tent. What would you guess a respite tent is? Like some, like a, like some rescues or something? Yes, yeah, like some rescue or something. That's so good. Respite sounds a lot like rescue. Okay, think about a day at the fair. What are some things when you've been out there all day that you start to feel, like when you've been out in the heat all day, what are some things you might need rescue from? You don't know. You were just having so much fun. Sometimes older people at the fair start to feel like it's a little too hot out there, and they start to get kind of thirsty, and they kind of just need a place to sit down. So that's some of the things that we provide at the respite tent. We provide seats in the shade with a fan blowing. We provide ice cold water. And we also provide a place for people to change diapers of their little ones. So knowing all that, that the tent is a place where people can take a break if they need it, have a little rest, have a little water, and provide a need of a place to change diapers. How would you describe respite? Rest. I think rest. Maybe we should just change the name to rest. Just cut out a couple letters there. A tent where we can rest. Yes. So this is one of our favorite things to do as a church is to offer respite or rest at the fair um, for our community. And the question I want to ask you is now that the fair is almost over, what are ways that we can offer respite or rest or rescue to people just in our everyday lives, not at the fair, but just wherever. Yes, Benjamin. Um, um, give them water if they need water. Give them water if they need water. That's always a good thing to do, is to help people when they're thirsty. What are some other things? Yes, I love. You can also give them food. Give them food if they're hungry? If, yes. Is, um, if they're like homeless, then you can like like, do blankets like we do? Yeah, and sometimes we make blankets for people who need them if they need, if they need warmth whenever the season requires that. Yes, absolutely. Or just comfort. That blanket sometimes is just a comfort to people who need comfort. Let's, let's come up with one more thing. What's one more thing that you could do even today when you leave church that you, Benjamin, or you, Isla, could do just to make somebody feel like they're being taken care of? Hmm. Benjamin. Help someone? Help someone. Maybe when you're leaving church today, you see somebody with their hands full and you can hold the door for them. Or maybe you see somebody who looks a little sad and you can just smile at them and say hello. Sometimes things as simple as that make people feel the same way our tent makes them feel, like somebody is looking out for them. And we want to treat people like that because we believe that God is looking out for us and we want people to know that. So those are some really good ideas. Um, Let's say a quick prayer before we do that. Y'all will take your little notebooks and crayons. If you haven't gotten one yet, you can just get one. Yeah. Let's see. Anna, do you have one? Where are mine? Yours is in there. Okay. There we go. We'll look for it in just a second. Um, And while you're listening today, you can either draw pictures from the scripture or the sermon or maybe new ideas of how we can offer respite to others. Yes. We'll find it. Let's see a quick prayer. God who gives us rest and peace, thank you for every opportunity to give rest and peace to others. Will you lead us and show us how? Will you let us receive the help of others when we are the ones in need of rest and peace? Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning picks up where April left off on page 1,752 in your pew Bibles. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Listen again for God's word. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace 
with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates divine love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by the blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Christ? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through Christ's life. Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Recently, Scott and I saw the movie Oppenheimer. We arrived at the theater in time to see the previews, accidentally, which all featured some dude fighting something or someone, lots of explosions and high-speed chases and violence. And I get it, these previews were targeted to the presumed audience of Oppenheimer, a film about the biggest explosion of all time. I could go on and on about how entertainment that makes light of death does not help us nurture a theology of life, but I won't. However, I will pause over the character of that cool leading guy who is time and again presented to us as the definition of strength. He's tough physically, perhaps also mentally if you think staring unflinchingly at death and danger is a sign of mental toughness. Nothing stresses him out, no one intimidates him. Usually his backstory contains some kind of suffering that he can't quite escape from, that fuels him to possess a seemingly otherworldly strength. He perseveres through that suffering and through every obstacle that comes his way. And he has some kind of code he lives by. Those who trust him with their lives consider him of unassailable character. This blockbuster hero could almost be what Paul describes in the letter to the Romans when he writes, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. But where is his hope? Instead of hope, this dude is jaded. He's as unlikely to shed a tear as crack a smile. He's unimpressed with everything and everyone around him. He's full of pithy comments, reminding everyone that for him, blowing things up and killing an enemy or two or 20 is no big deal. It's all in a day's work. For the empires of entertainment, suffering produces perseverance, 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 some kind of code to live by, all with a side of cynicism. This kind of hero is not so different from the characters who captured the imagination of the first century Roman Empire, where stories of valor from gladiators and soldiers reign. The same notions of success and strength that splash across our screens were held in the stories told when people gathered. Someone might have been telling a story like that, a story of a strong hero overcoming all the odds and facing death with a flippant comment when the letter from Paul arrived to the church in Rome. They would have dashed in with the letter, interrupting all other conversation. It's here. 
the response from Paul to all of our questions. This was a community full of questions. The Roman church was started by Jewish followers of the way, folks who just like Jesus and Paul never stopped being Jewish, even as they began to believe in Jesus as the Messiah and began to trust resurrection hope. Over time, others joined the Roman church, but the congregation maintained Jewish majority and leadership. The Roman Empire, held together with stories of heroic generals and strong gladiators, was all too aware of this church, of these followers of the way, who had a dangerous hope, making them question existing systems and structures. The empire decided not to tolerate the troublemakers. Empires aren't usually interested in differentiating between the guilty and those who simply look like them. So all Jews, followers of the way and otherwise, were expelled from Rome by an edict from Emperor Claudius. Nevertheless, the church persisted despite the edict. The Jewish majority left, but others stayed. New leaders were formed, new rituals and practices were instituted. When Emperor Claudius died a few years later, the exiles returned home to a changed church, bringing tension over who should lead, those who returned or those who had stayed, and struggles over what to do with the Torah and Jewish tradition. How should those who believed Jesus was the Messiah understand the old sacred stories and the record of God's law? And what role did those stories and laws play for the folks in the Roman church who were not Jewish? Did they need to become Jewish to follow Jesus? This is the church that receives Paul's letter, a complex community of diverse backgrounds and theologies struggling for unity. This letter was written almost 20 years after the crucifixion and initial resurrection sightings and almost 20 years after Paul encountered the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. All this time, all this ministry, all this writing, all this faith, and Paul can't escape from hope. The hope that began in the sacred stories recorded in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, Paul, the faithful Jew, had always found hope in the law. And he writes to the church struggling with the law's role in their faith in the risen Christ. Instead of saying, throw the Torah out, you don't need it anymore, or continue to keep every law, that's the measure of faith, Paul pulls from the Torah and weaves together the old stories with new understanding, weaving hope from Genesis through Jesus. Paul points to the examples of Abraham and Sarah, writing somewhat harshly, Abraham's body was as good as dead. Sarah's womb was also dead. Dead, dead. You will not surely die, die, the serpent hissed to Eve in Eden, convincing her to taste the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the ancient world as well as this one, death and bringing forth life are horizons that highlight human limitation and divine presence. It is so when a loved one dies. When death is sudden, we are overwhelmed with our limitations, frailty, and ineffectiveness. When death is expected, attended, and awaited, even then our limitations, frailty, and ineffectiveness are on display. We await and cannot rush that which is beyond us. We cannot predict death, much less stop it. We cannot reverse it. Death is reverse, O death, where is your sting? But our experience of that reversal remains a promise, a mystery, and it is one we cannot accomplish, a mystery we hope for in faith. We meet our limitations, frailty, and ineffectiveness in death, and so it is in life. 
as it was for Abraham and Sarah, it remains so for countless couples, even in this modern age. Infertility starkly reveals our humanity as we learn to beg God and we learn to be angry with God. Infertility aside, bringing a child into this world is a long, slow reminder of all that we cannot do. We cannot rush pregnancy, we cannot rush labor, we cannot rush the newborn stage, or that stage when they're two and their primary form of communication is whining, or that stage when they're 12 and their primary form of communication is sarcasm that doesn't quite land yet. There is no rushing this, any of it. And it is not a process that makes us feel great. Indeed, it's a process of encountering failure over and over again. Naming Abraham and Sarah, Paul invokes all of this, this reminder of all that is beyond us in our human limitation, frailty, and ineffectiveness. To return to the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. The God who is a creator and a recreator. The God who gives life and life everlasting. It is our limitations, frailty, and ineffectiveness that make us, just like the first century Romans, susceptible to those stories with heroes portrayed as aloof and unassailable, physically strong and emotionally reserved. These conquerors defy death, laugh at death, and temporarily that feels like victory. But we were created to long for an eternal victory. You will not surely die, die. They were truly dead, dead. And God gives life to the dead and calls into thing, being things that were not. Life, life. God planted the garden and placed the first humans there, protecting them from death. But protection from death also meant protection from life. So the garden was closed and the people were clothed and sent out to live in a wide open place where they were vulnerable and they continued to know and love God. Generations passed and Abraham and Sarah were made a promise that they could not achieve on their own despite their scheming attempts. God had to do this. God had to bring forth life out of death and God did. Generations passed and laws were given so God's people would know how to live rule after rule in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, and the crux of these laws were life and death. This is what you do if someone dies accidentally at your hands. This is what you do if someone gets pregnant. This is what you do if you touch a dead body. This is what you do to return again and again to the reality that life and death are in God's hands, not ours. Paul writes about Abraham and the law as a reminder that life and death are in God's hands, not ours. God is the one who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not, the God of hope. And the God who calls into being things that were not is calling into being a new way of pursuing God, a way weaving the old promises and laws together with the new resurrection reality. Dead, dead, life, life, hope, hope. With hope and in hope, Abraham believed. With hope and in hope, some translations say against hope, hoping against hope. Paul reiterated hope, wrote it twice, just as he wrote death twice. And each instance of hope was paired with a different preposition, illustrating the abundant presence of hope. Whether Abraham was in hope or under hope or with hope or hoping against hope, Paul's, Abraham's faith is inextricable from hope. From death to hope. From death to hope. From every kind of suffering to hope. Hope is what's missing from pop culture. From the ancient gladiators to Hollywood heroes, time and again the story of strength is the story of separation, an attitude of being above death. But scripture tells a story not of avoiding death, but overcoming it. The heroes of the faith are not jaded, but hopeful. 
For the empires of entertainment, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, some kind of code to live by, all with a side of cynicism. For us, for followers of the way in every age, we know that suffering produces perseverance. Don't we know it? Look back over your life and see the moments where suffering was the teacher of perseverance. And perseverance, character. Don't we know it? Think of the folks whose character you admire. They are the ones who have gone through difficult things and found an otherworldly grace and confidence. A character of peace, rooted in knowing the power of God and the kindness of others. And character, hope. Hope is the mark of true faith and true strength. May we be armed against the stories that tell us that strength looks like laughing at or causing the suffering of others. Rather, may we receive by God's grace the hope that allows us to question death's sting while comforting others in their grief, the hope to be present with others in their suffering and to receive the presence of others in our suffering. The hope of that is staked in the only thing we may boast in, the gift of reconciliation in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hope is not the beginning, but the end. Then hope is the beginning again by the grace of our God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Hope is not child's play, though those with a childlike faith have it. Hope is not light or fluffy or inconsequential. Hope is born from death. Hope is resurrected from crucifixion. Hope outlasts all suffering. Amen. Please rise as you feel able as we confess together what we believe using a couple of questions from the Heidelberg Catechism which are printed in your bulletins. What is your only comfort in life and in death? I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has paid for me for all my sins, his precious blood. He has also loved me in such a way not a hair at all without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation, because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, which gives me an eternal life, and makes me holy for him. How do you come to know this? The Holy Gospel tells me. God began to reveal the Gospel already in paradise. Later God proclaimed it by the holy patriarch and prophets and foreshadowed it by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. And finally God fulfilled it through his own blood son. Let's remain standing and sing together hymn number 438, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me.
Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. We give, practicing letting go of all that we think is ours. We give so that others may know the otherworldly hope we have staked our lives on. How is God moving us to give and live today? Thank you for the many ways you provide for us. May we love as you have loved us. May these gifts in our lives reveal your love to others. Amen. Let's more join our hearts in prayer. Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, 
You are the one, the only one, who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. May we know this and may it lead us to hope. May we find hope even in grief. We pray for those for whom loss is recent. May they have grace for themselves as they learn a world without their loved one. May they know your grace and presence through the kindness of others. May they know your peace, which surpasses all understanding. We pray especially for the Rankin family this morning. May we find hope even as Paul's words about Sarah and Abraham resonate all too well, that their bodies, which were once full of life, now seem dead. We struggle as we lose abilities we once took for granted. Hearing fades, eyesight fades, memories fade, knees get sore and backs wear out, and hope is hard to find because we know these aches and pains are likely to multiply. May a season of frustration with what we were once able to do become a season of hope in you. When we are physically unable, perhaps we can learn anew that every good thing is grace, not achievement, not earned. And grace is something we can always experience, always receive. May we find hope through every suffering that comes our way, whether it's rejection, fear about the future, uncertainty about how to live as our whole authentic self. There are so many ways to suffer in this world. When we are in the midst of suffering, may we hope and hope knowing the suffering will not last forever and it is doing something within us by your grace. Even as we long to believe this, we are aware of the suffering of others and are not sure that we should pray for their perseverance, even if your word promises hope. We're not sure just how to pray when we see headlines like the one from Montgomery this past week, but we do pray for justice. We pray for your peace and your unity, which preserves diversity. We pray for a nonviolent way and we pray for true healing and true humility. We certainly, Holy Creator, do not know how to pray for Hawaii. So much death and destruction. We can't imagine the damage. We also have a hard time imagining the hope that your word promises comes on the other side of suffering. In moments like this, we get frustrated with you and your ways. Can't hope come more easily? Why can't there be less devastation, less loss? We are grateful that you welcome our questions, our fear, our anger, and we are grateful that when we do not know how to pray, you have already given us the words. And we join our hearts and voices with followers of your way in every time and place, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is. Give us this day our day. Forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's rise and sing together hymn number 353 My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
hope is not the beginning, but the end. Hope is not only the end, but also the beginning. And by the grace of our God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not, we have hope to begin again and again and again. May we experience hope today. May we share hope with others, the hope and peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding. And now, may God hear and respond whenever you may call. May Christ be made known to you in all things. May the Holy Spirit open our eyes and fill our hearts with love. We go in hope and peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.